Hey everyone, welcome. Jenna Sullivan here, and we are discussing James chapter three. This is session one of James chapter three. So we do two, two sessions uh, that allow us to kind of dig in a little bit more. So he starts out with not many of you should become teachers. <laughs> That's James 3, 1. And I know a lot of us are teachers. A lot of us maybe aren't vocational teachers, but if you have a child in the home or have been a mom in the past, been a teacher. <laughs> so uh, even if you consider um, the people in your life, right, the people in your life that you uh, are around, right, we're always helping others and in a way that's teaching. So if we think though about teachers today, and if we think about the vocational teacher, it's a thankless job. You know, teachers today have parents that are obnoxious. They have students that are more obnoxious. <laughs> I feel like I feel like things have gotten worse for teachers. And I also consider the teacher profession to be um, underpaid, right? Overworked. <laughs> so, you know, it's not a glamorous job. Interestingly enough, though, teach, a teacher back then, so if we were to look at James' time frame, the reason he would state not many of you should be teachers is because many people wanted to be teachers. It was like the lawyer or the doctor of the day. That was one of the most well thought after, most respectable positions one could have. And so a lot of people sought to be a teacher. Uh, what is interesting, though, about James chapter three is he almost, I don't know that this is, was his intention, so I can't speak to that, but it's almost like he's like, not many of you should be teachers, and here's why. And then he goes into this 13 verse brilliant teaching strategy. It's almost like he shows them this is sort of what it takes to be a teacher. Could you do this? Like, this is rough. This is, I'm, he came up with eight different analogies in 13 verses. And when I think about good teachers, teachers that I love to listen to, teachers that make sense to me are the ones who use really good, thoughtful analogies. And they're storytellers. They're not just dry. I just sat through a whole convention recently and I thought, what's what's going on here? Why am I kind of bored? <laughs> and I realized because not a single one of them was using any analogies or stories. They were just teaching the dry concepts only, which is really hard to follow. <laughs> so uh, the mark of a good teacher is one who's a really good storyteller, who is good at using anal analogies, similes, metaphors. So I love how James really is brilliant and he's using, you know, eight different analogies in 13 different verses. Um, if we look at also James as a whole, we can see that chapter one is his sort of abstract, kind of this is what we're gonna be talking about. And then chapters two through five, he gets into um, his exposition of it. He's like exposing each one and talking more at length. So if we were to look at chapter two, it expanded on verses um, nine and 22 in chapter one, that would be the humility and partiality. And then faith, faith and works. Uh, then in chapter three, he takes chap, you know, verse 119 and 15. So we're looking at our words and wisdom and expanding on this in chapter three. And so it's, it's excellent, really, you know, chapter three, it's, it's verses one through 13. And then uh, the um, chapter three, that's the, uh, excuse me, the words part of it. And then the wisdom part of it is uh, 14 and beyond. So what's interesting, if we were to think about coming up with a theme title, one of my favorite things to do is question number nine. So if you're following along in our workbook, question nine is in the first context of each chapter is come up with a short theme title. The challenge is in three to five words, right? So I don't know how many of you guys were able to come up with one. My first attempt was speak with godly wisdom. And I thought, yay, I nailed it in under five words. But as I was studying more, I realized it's really in meekness, like in meekness, we need to speak with godly wis wisdom. And then I realized it's really, we need to, with humility, right? In meekness of godly wisdom, speak. We need to speak after we have that humility and godly wisdom. 
And, you know, my first attempt was speak with godly wisdom. So it was like, let me flip those words around. We need to really consider our humility first, the meekness of where we're coming from and, and in godly wisdom and then speak. <laughs> so when I want to um, move through this is what does that really look like in action? So if I were to consider uh, how I would respond versus react, I feel like oftentimes I'm going through my day reacting to things. Uh, do you feel that way? Do you feel like you're, rather than contemplating and being mindful and responding, it's this react. So yesterday, um, we've, we've just had a lot of stress in our family recently and just a lot going on and a little bit to the breaking point of over having too much on our plate. Um, and I asked Tim to bring something home from the office and he came in pretty fast and I'm like, hey, did you bring the envelope I needed? And he said, no, I don't have time for that. And I flipped out. You don't have time for that? It's a simple envelope grab the envelope. Like I, I was like yelling at him, like what in the world? And he was like, seriously, I don't have time for that. And I got so mad because I thought, well, how do you not have time to grab an envelope? I, and I ask him for, you know, in my mind, I start now justifying. I ask you for so little. I hardly ever ask you for anything. When I ask you for something, really, that's your response that you don't have time for me. <laughs> like I was so mad and I was hurt. So I lashed out instantly reacted. Um, my son was in the living room and I think he like with horror was like, oh, well, I guess we're not going driving, you know? And then he walked back upstairs cause like now I'm upset and I'm running upstairs to try and find an envelope cause I needed it to ship out. And I'm like, what in the world? Come to find out later, it was because he had to go to the bathroom really bad and was rushing home to, get, to go to the bathroom. And, you know, I didn't know the whole situation and he didn't mean I don't have time for you. He just meant I got to pee. <laughs> so it was an interesting sort of man, you know, he was he was my response, my reaction to him caused him to be sort of like irritated with me. So then he left to go to the post office without the letter that I needed to mail, you know, it was really an interesting scenario because my reaction caused him to be like, Ooh, she's spicy. I'm out of here. And when they left, I, I just sat down and cried, you know, and started like thinking about all the things that he doesn't appreciate. Ah, you know, I spiraled and my simple reaction caused a spiral. And I think, wow, that's what it, it, you know, when we think about what does this look like in action, that's not what this looks like in action. This was me spiraling, spiraling into sin, only to find out later that all of it was a misunderstanding and none of it had to do with him not caring about me. It, you know, it was a simple, different, like perspective. You know, I was in, I was in black and white mode and he was like, gotta pee. <laughs> so when I think about reacting versus responding, my best advice is to pray for a pause. Now, this is the problem too. I'm often thinking, how should Jen respond, right? It's always this, how should Jen respond? When the real question really should be, how, how would Jesus respond in this situation? You guys remember in 1990, the What Would Jesus Do movement, the WWJD um, the bracelets, bracelets everybody was wearing? That actually, that phrase was, uh, was um, coined in 1896 by Charles Sheldon. He had this wildly popular book called In His Steps, What Would Jesus Do? Over 50 million copies have been sold. He's actually in the top selling books um, of all time. But when you look at all the top selling books, what's interesting is 50 million copies. That's a lot. The Hobbit, 140 million copies. Don Quixote, right? Don Quixote tops out um, the most popular book, like reader book of all time um, at 500 million copies. The Quran, 800 million copies. Can any of you guess how many copies the Bible has sold? Like how many of all time, how many Bibles have sold? <laughs> this is an interesting question to me. Uh, eight billion. Okay, so if you put that in perspective, if you took eight billion dollars versus say 80 million, so we'll just, you know, I, I think this is interesting when you think the top spiritual book in the world outside of the Bible is the Quran. Next to that at like 170 million is the Book of Mormon, which again, that's super low. But why such a drastic 
um, number difference between the Quran and the Bible. And I think God will not be outdone. You know, he will not be outdone, especially with his word. If you take a look at um, dollar bills, like hundred dollar bills, hundred dollar bills stacked um, for 800 million would cover, it would take about 80 backpacks to fit, fit all that in. So 80 backpacks of money. Um, if you were to look at eight, billion dollars, you're now looking at 80 pallets, you know, forklift pallets, those huge massive pallets all stacked with hundred dollar bills. <laughs> it's a big difference. If you were to look at pennies, this is kind of another fun analogy. You would have stacked pennies for the Quran would be uh, 700 miles of stacked pennies. That would be from here to say Salt Lake City. So that would be Orange County, California to Salt Lake City, Utah. If you were to stack the same pennies based on 8 billion, you're talking here, you know, California stacking pennies all the way to the Philippines. It's 7,000 miles. So, you know, it just helps us get perspective on it's, it's exponentially larger. The, the number of Bibles on the planet is exponentially larger than any other book, all books combined, you know, if you want to go that route. So when we think about this statement going back to okay if i'm i'm what should i be doing how should i be praying for a pause how would jesus respond to this what is re reacting versus responding look like and what does this whole wisdom look like right james is going on to great lengths to explain how our tongue sets a forest ablaze how our tongue is like impossible to bridle you know all of these things that how is it possible that out of the same mouth comes you know cursing and blessing that doesn't happen with water that should, you know figs don't grow apples basically right so so what is wisdom and if we look at wisdom from um what it's described as the bible so james 3 17 says but the wisdom from above is first pure then peaceable gentle open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. That to me sounds like a description of Jesus. What would Jesus do? Well, he would be, he's pure about things and he would be peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. That's a picture of Jesus. So when we think about the Holy Spirit and his work in us, that's the Holy Spirit working through us. So Oddly, when you think about this verse, 317, it sounds a lot like the fruits of the spirit. So if I think about, and the spirit of, you know, when we think about the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the fruits of the spirit. So if we think about wisdom as the spirit, the Holy Spirit in us, God puts his wisdom in us through the Holy Spirit. So if I were to look and just think of 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 13, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God, that we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths and those who are spiritual. So when we think about the Holy Spirit, that is godly wisdom. So how would we then decipher this? Well, I would look at wisdom, right? The Holy Spirit is wisdom. James seven. Um, so James three seventeen is who the Spirit is. Wisdom. The Holy Spirit is Jesus. Is right. What would Jesus do? Well, He is pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. The outcome of that. The outcome of having the spirit in us is fruit. And that fruit is jo love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? So it's a beautiful picture of who the spirit is and the outcome of having that spirit in us. And all of these things hinge on godly wisdom. So I wanna leave you with a story because storytelling is fun. Think about um, this big, huge, beautiful cliff overlooking a ravine with a, a lake running down it. And on the other side is a beautiful pasture. And there's an Indian chief sitting with a little boy. And the little boy comes up and says, Indian chief, can you please tell me what wisdom is? 
So the Indian chief gives him a handful of tiny feathers and he says, I want you to throw these up in the air. So the little boy takes these feathers and tosses them up and the wind takes them and some of them fly over down the ravine, down into the river and then you can see them floating down the river. Some go over all the way across to the pasture on the other side. Some float back and out of sight behind them. They're just everywhere. They've just kind of flown everywhere. Then the chief looks at the boy and says, now I want you to go and retrieve every single feather and bring it back to me. And the little boy laughs and he says, well, that's impossible. And the chief says, so it is with our words. Once we let them go, we can never get them back. So I want you to remember that we can never take back our words. Sisters, I want you to always pray for a pause. Always pray for godly wisdom. And then in meekness, in humility, then and only then speak. All right, we'll see you next time. Take care.